You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available in the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at twitter.com slash options, stocktwits.com slash options, facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the optionsinsider.com. The Options Insider Radio Network is sponsored by Fidelity Investments. Fidelity's Option Trade Builder tool can help you confidently build an options trade in three simple steps. Just choose a strategy, select a contract, and then review the benefits and risks of the trade. Learn more about Option Trade Builder at fidelity.com backslash options. Options trading entails significant risk and is not appropriate for all investors. Certain complex option strategies carry additional risk. Before trading options, contact Fidelity Investments by calling 800-544-5115 to receive a copy of the characteristics and risks of standardized options. Fidelity Brokerage Services, LLC, member NYSC SIPC. Bitcoin, Ether, Ripple, Litecoin, and more. Cryptocurrencies and other digital assets are taking the financial world by storm. This exploding market provides everything a savvy trader needs. Volatility, volume, and liquidity. Provided you know how to find it. That's where we come in. Welcome to the Crypto Rundown. Each week we'll break down the latest trading activity, trends, and developments on everything from coins to tokens, futures, and even OTC options. If it's moving the crypto markets, then you'll find it on the Crypto Rundown. Now it's time to dive into the exploding world of cryptocurrencies and digital assets. It's time for the Crypto Rundown. All right, everybody. That music can mean only one thing. It is time to break down what is going on in the world of crypto, the spot, the derivatives, all that fun stuff. Yeah, but it's time for the Crypto Rundown. My name is Mark Longo from the OptionsInsider.com, as well as, of course, from the ever-exciting Options Insider Radio Network. Hope you guys are enjoying the slew of content hitting the network these days from the STA conference I just came back from in D.C. Last year was a crypto bonanza down there, quite frankly. Most of the guests... At an equities conference, we're primarily on the crypto side of the fence. This year, more of a mixed offering, which was fun and interesting in and of itself. Stay tuned to the network to check all of that out. And, of course, joining me on the program, we'd like to welcome on guests from throughout the world of crypto. So joining me in the crypto hot seat. we got a great guest, so let's get to it. Time to roll out the crypto hot seat. Forget about cold storage. It's time to turn up the heat on thought leaders from the world of cryptocurrencies and digital assets. It's time to take their place on the Crypto Hot Seat. All right, everybody. Welcome to the Crypto Hot Seat, the portion of the program where we welcome on guests from throughout the world of crypto and derivatives and indeed beyond and proceed to pick their brains for the benefit of you. The listener, our next guest, is a newcomer to the program and indeed to the network. He is Darshan Vaidya. He is the CEO and founder over there at X Margin. Darshan, welcome to the Crypto Rundown program. Hey, uh, great to be on. Darshan, you come highly recommended by some of our previous guests, so we're looking forward to having you on the program. But I think we'll start as we do with all of our first timers. Why don't you go ahead, give our audience a little bit of an overview of your background in the financial space and and how you found your way into the world of crypto, sir. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Thanks for having me on. And uh, yeah, my background is much like uh, a lot of the people in the space right now. Uh, I was an options market maker in traditional finance for uh, around 10 years and was trading interest rate options and basically saw crypto as an opportunity to apply many of the same market-making techniques um, across options especially. So um, was one of the market makers on Deribit quite early on, and we've, um, we've been market-making on there 
for a couple of years um, was running a small derivatives market making desk essentially where most of our activity was on Deribit and some of it was bilateral as well OTC and essentially came across the clearing problem that a lot of trading firms face today um, which is just that you tend to have to trade across multiple counterparties and across multiple derivatives venues, like whether it be BitMEX, Deribit, or just OTC. And there was just no real reliable way to clear uh, across all of those count- all of those venues. And so we'd end up having to place a lot of collateral across different venues, and it just became extremely inefficient and difficult to scale. So that's when we decided to set up X margin, which is a clearing solution, um, but does so without having to require a central counterparty. So it works more like a calculation agent using zero knowledge technology to essentially give you capital efficiency across multiple counterparties, um, but without having to have like a big trusted central counterparty. So um, in traditional finance, generally what happens is we have a, a big central clearer that sits in between all the derivatives trades that is able to just take that risk themselves and you know that they're going to be there because they have a ton of collateral um, and that's something that we've been lacking in the crypto space and perhaps in the future we'll have Um, but in the meantime for getting the same capital efficiency at a much cheaper cost we essentially developed this uh, distributed solution whereby you could use zero knowledge technology to get the same same benefits. You know, it's funny. I, I can hear a certain segment of our audience groaning and saying, oh, God, central clearing, you know, because that in many ways is anathema to that core spirit that really drove the creation of the crypto markets, getting away from the centralized, cleared, listed, all the issues people have seen over the years with the listed markets, equities, options. Pick your poison, of course, fiat currency as well. There's a certain cadre out there that really wants to get away from all of them. But then, of course, as we've discussed many times on this program, if the crypto markets and the crypto derivatives markets in particular really want to graduate to that next level, they want to be able to be effectively a quote-unquote big boy market, to be able to do the big size that people want to see in the transactions people want to go up out there. They need to have these underpinnings. You know, I've joked about it before on the show that it's not the sexiest thing in the world. It's, it's the plumbing. It's the infrastructure of the crypto market. Yet that's what needs to be put in place really to bring a lot of these large players to the space. But I think you kind of outlined very interestingly there. You come from a traditional financial world. So guys like you and me, options market makers, central clearing is, is kind of the way it's done. Is it challenging for you really to reconcile that viewpoint with what we see in the crypto space, which is, you know, central clearing is pretty much the enemy. Let's get away from it. Yeah, I mean, it, I think I understand why traditional finance firms prefer central clearing. It's kind of what we know. It's what it's what's proven to work, um, provided that the central clearer is big enough and reliable. But um, where it falls apart really is in... Um, in asset classes where there is no real incentive for them to sit in there because they don't understand the risks. So the likes of London Clearinghouse probably won't want to be a clearer within crypto because it's probably too small a market for them. And also one where they probably don't fully understand the risks and they don't want to offer that that central clearing service. And where we come in is, is to move away from that central clearing model to a more distributed model whereby, um, we're probably more with the ethos of the crypto world where we essentially remove the need for that central counterparty. So if you're trading bilaterally with four or five different people, you can continue to trade bilaterally with those four or five people. But instead of having a guy in the middle that is aware of all of your information and is clearing on your behalf, you're essentially able to programmatically do that with zero knowledge technology so what i mean by the zero knowledge technology is just that we take your positions um, that are encrypted and then do the same calculations that a central clearinghouse might do but we do it without seeing your position and then essentially have a programmatic way of settling those trades uh, with the help of a custodian but again in a way that doesn't involve us having to see your overall position so the idea is to try and meet both worlds in the middle. So keep things distributed, keep things without a big central trusted counterparty, but 
take the methodologies that maybe a central person might uh, do to give the capital efficiencies that um, that um, that they offer. So yeah, I, I completely agree that we should try and move away from a centralized model, but I also appreciate the benefits that it perhaps offers um, and why it offers those. I think you just encapsulated the dance that a lot of our guests are trying to do in this space right now, which is they're trying to bring some semblance of modern financial functionality to the crypto space while still trying to acknowledge or or do honor you know to that that ethos you're right that that primary spirit that kicked the whole thing off really in gusto i mean obviously they've been around for a while but really in gusto uh, a few years back so it is interesting to see how that dance is going and how is it going how are these early days over there at x margin what has the response from the market been there's been a great deal of interest, obviously, from the trading firms themselves that currently struggle with the same problem that we have. And um, so we have a bunch of people that are willing to try our product, and we're hoping to launch that in mid-November. We built a proof of concept that showed zero-knowledge clearing essentially working, so trading across multiple counterparties and getting getting the margin relief across all of those counterparties without having to... Uh, trust a central counterparty with that information. So doing it all in a zero knowledge way. So we proved that concept, and now um, uh, and, and now yeah, we're building out the MVP, which should be ready by mid November, and we'll have uh, some of the larger trading firms on there um, uh, testing it out and um, in- integrating with a number of different exchanges as well. Is there a certain area where you're doing the lion's share? of your volume? Are you pulling it in from, let's say, firms in Asia or Europe? Or wh- where are you drawing these early testers of the platform? So the early testers of the platform are all over, really. So some based in the UK, some based in Australia. I'm sure you've had some of them on, on the calls before. Australia is the new hot seat of all things crypto these days, it seems exactly, like. Exactly, yeah. Um, so there's a ton of firms out in Asia and Australia that are doing some uh, great derivatives, offerings out there and they're keen to to test out our solution but we also have some uh people here based in the u.s that are also uh on board to test our solution out and then there are the likes of um, the the consumer side like the mining firms that are looking for derivatives hedging but they're looking for a clearing solution where they don't have to trust the 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 market maker completely so we're speaking to a number of those as well who have expressed interest in testing out our solution so yeah it's been going well it's just completely um it's moving at a, a pretty quick rate um compared to what i'm used to in trading but it's um but it's going it's going well and where are you guys based where is hq there for uh, x margin uh i'm in san francisco and um yeah we, we're, we're based out here Interesting. I'm so used to having most of our guests be from, you know, Australia or Asia or Europe. You know, there's, we don't get a lot. I mean, we get some, obviously. We've had the Gemini folks on. Obviously, they're based here. So there are big players in the U.S. going after this market as well. But just for the regulatory reasons alone, it's been an issue for a lot of our, a lot of our domestic firms. What are your thoughts there, uh, Darshan? Obviously, it's been an interesting side of the space. Obviously, the regulatory scene still very much in flux when it comes to the crypto space. That's been a challenge. Again, that's one of the reasons why a lot of the firms have moved to overseas markets and have been focusing on those areas, let's say Australia, Asia, Europe, a little bit more friendly when it comes to adopting crypto. Has that been a challenge for you guys here being based in in San Fran, you know, the U.S. right now? We're the leader in most financial markets in crypto, maybe not so much. Yeah, it's it's strange because I I moved here about, Two years ago, and didn't really appreciate the difference in regulatory landscape until actually being here and actually trying to solve this problem. But it is very different. Um, I think the rewards and the upside in solving a problem that works both in the U.S. and internationally are a little bit uh, are, are quite high. And as a result, I think we're trying to navigate um, a regulatory environment that's not very transparent and quite opaque. And as a result, I think. It's challenging, but um, you know we we do believe that whilst it's easier to just set up outside of the U.S., I think our solution needs to be compatible with the U.S. for, for wide adoption. So, um, given that the, the number of firms that actually end up using a central or either a central clearing or a distributed clearing solution 
are going to be quite small. I think it needs to be a solution that navigates regulation both in the US and externally. So we've been handling that essentially by working with existing players in the space. Um, and uh, theoretically, we work as a calculation agent as opposed to having to be this regulated clearing organization. So whilst we do conform to various regulatory bounds, we because of the, the use of zero knowledge technology and the fact that we're not the central counterparty, we're able to bypass a lot of that and provide some of the capital efficiency without some of the regulatory burden. Have you been out there in the San Fran area raising money? Is that why you guys are pretty much set up there? Uh, no, actually, we're in San Fran area mostly for personal reason. My wife works out here, but uh, I, uh, um, but we have done a small raise, uh, which we're just closing up right now. And uh, San Fran's a great place to do that. But um, I actually find that New York is a great area as well. Like the, from a fintech perspective, it's it's very compatible to um, to what we're doing. Interesting. And your point earlier, you know, is, is interesting as well, where you, a lot of the other markets are very much the hotbeds right now. But if this market really wants to wants to turn up to 11, if it really wants to become the, the quote unquote big boy market that everyone I know in that space really hopes it could be, then it needs to have the large U.S. players on board from a liquidity perspective, from a customer perspective. So that's really where you need to make that happen. So it makes sense from your perspective, where if you're working on the clearing side, then you definitely want to, at the very least, want to be able to entice a lot of the U.S. firms on board. And that probably would be a little bit more of a challenge if you were in Singapore or Sydney or, or somewhere else there. Yeah, I, I think the, um, I mean, for certain exchanges, it definitely makes sense to be overseas and perhaps ignore the U.S. market for now. But um, it's been quite a successful model for quite, quite a few entities out there. But um, for what we're trying to do is a little bit more niche and, trying to essentially, like you said, build the pipes for for um, the derivatives market to, to hopefully exponentially grow upon. And so if we're going to build the pipes, we kind of have to build them everywhere as opposed to just in one place. Uh, you know, we're going to get into our, our Bitcoin breakdown in a second. We're going to break down all the, the crazy price action we've seen just even over the past week. But it's been a crazy year looking back on Bitcoin as well from a price action perspective. Obviously, you've been building this platform for quite some time. I don't think you just started X margin right after the worm turned in March. You you probably were building and, and hitting away at it for some time. What was it like for you guys and your team over there, whether you're out there raising money or just trying to drum up interest in the platform when Bitcoin and the rest of the crypto markets were really in the teeth there of the of the crypto winter? You know, we were threatening three thousand to the downside. It seemed like the bloom was certainly off the rose. Were you starting to maybe second guess yourself, say maybe I should be looking elsewhere? Or did you remain firmly committed throughout the entirety of that time? Well, yeah, I mean, we were trading from throughout like all of that crypto winter. So from when it went down to around 3,000, all the way back up to around 8,000. Um, and we, we've been building out the product, but we were running the, the hedge fund up until May, June time. And so... It certainly was an interesting time, but as options market makers, um, one of the good and the bad is that we kind of enjoy panic, we enjoy irrational behavior, and so whilst it was not great that the market was going down to 3,000, it certainly presented itself with a ton of opportunity. So um, there was a lot of two-way options volume, but... um, I think it's just been interesting to see how the sentiment changed in March and April um, as things sort of turned, as you said. And since then, it's uh, there's been a variety of things like the backed thing, which I'm sure we'll talk about. But the um, positive sentiment that people are starting to feel, and I think it's a case of realizing what the use cases are for specific asset classes and figuring out which, which pigeonhole we're going to put them in if, if we are. And as a result, perhaps that um, consensus driving the optimism. And whilst there has been a bit of a heavy feeling to the market as a whole since the backed thing, um, I think uh, overall the optimism and uh, I guess more 
consensus that we have about the cryptocurrencies that we're trading and what they're actually going to be used for, whether it's a store of value or whether it's you know a token that's a utility token, I feel like that clarification is building confidence in the market. And as a result, compared to a year ago today, the, the, the sentiment, whilst not as bullish as it was maybe two, three months ago, is still, I would say, still much more bullish than it has been for a while. Well, since we're talking about sentiment, let's get right to it with a little bit of the old Bitcoin breakdown. It's time to explore the latest trading activity, trends, and developments across the world's leading crypto market. It's time for the Bitcoin Breakdown. All right, everyone. Welcome to the Bitcoin Breakdown. This is indeed the portion of the show where we break down the crazy, topsy-turvy, turbulent week that was and indeed still is out there across the broad spectrum of crypto. So we're talking spot, we're talking the future, some of the options, all that good stuff. And what a crazy, tumultuous week it has been. In fact, if you just looked from the end of last show to the beginning of this show, you'd think there wasn't really a heck of a lot. The Bitcoin was almost literally unched. We went out last show about 82.95. It came into today's show about 82.85. So it seemed like uh, a pretty quiet week. And yet a lot unfolded over the course of that week from in between those two endpoints. Uh, pretty much right after our show last week, going into Tuesday, uh, we saw the high of the week. That was around 84 half or so. And then it pretty much turned right around to the downside shortly thereafter on Wednesday and Thursday. Break, threatening to break 8,000 on the downside. Got close, but didn't quite make it. Finally broke through 8,000 to the dark side there on the weekend there on Sunday and threatened, threatened that 7,800 level. Uh, I know a lot of people were watching, actually, that 7,700, 77 half or so is a kind of a key support level on the downside. That's pretty much the 100-week moving average down there. It was threatening to get down to there at one point. And then it seemed like it decided to just bounce off those levels. That's why people have claimed out there, I've never been the biggest technical guy. A lot of people like technicals in crypto. We've had a lot of the crypto patterns and other guys on the show over the past year or so breaking it down. And it certainly did seem to hold up here this week, bouncing from very near that 100-day moving average to the downside and pretty much rallied nearly 500 handles to come into showtime. Like I said, it was effectively unched. It has given up some of that, give some of that back now about Looks like about 60-odd handles, so at about 82.25 or so. So we're, we're pretty much off about 60 handles from where we were last week, but still a, a tumultuous week uh, therein. You know, the interesting thing, though, it, it, despite that sell-off we saw last week and then the rally, uh, they had an interesting breakdown. I believe this was over there on, uh, on Coindesk about, despite all that, Bitcoin's still one of the best performing, actually, of major assets. It's pretty much the best performing asset so far of 2019 if you just break it down by pure return over the course of the year of course as i just mentioned earlier we had the crypto winter we bounced from there still well off that pretty much 3000 level uh so that puts uh bitcoin up about uh let's see about 31 per- oh no the tech stocks <laughs> have been up about 31 percent so far this year uh bitcoin 8000 uh, at the level this was taken was about 8300 that would put it up to 114 percent on the year, so more than doubling your money. Uh, 10-year bond yields about 1.6%. Uh, stocks, just the broad large-cap stocks of the S&P, up 21%. Like I said, tech stocks up a bit more, 31%. Gold up a paltry 17%. So of all those major assets, Bitcoin looking uh, pretty interesting. I'm, I'm sure it was a pretty interesting out there, Darshan, on the clearing side as well over this past week. Maybe on the trading side as well, if you guys are still actively trading out there i don't know but just to watch this week of you know we sell off the worm turns and then we rally back around what's what's the past week been like for you guys over there has it drummed up more interest in the platform yeah i mean i think what's becoming clear is that you know the volatility out there is drumming up a lot of interest in trading both derivatives and instruments to protect protect these assets while while we're at these levels and so yeah, certainly more interest from a speculation perspective from people using it as an investment product. Uh, we've spoken to a number of different funds that are trying to use derivatives to generate yield and on top of Bitcoin's already impressive performance. So I think as it becomes a recognized asset class amongst uh, hedge funds or at least funded funds, um, the the use, uses of derivatives to sort of either magnify those gains or to hedge those gains will become more and more popular. 
Did a week like this past week, did it make you a little wistful that you weren't back there on the old market-making desk again? Uh, yeah, I mean, of course, you always miss it. But, you know, um, it's, uh, yeah, it, it's, it's obviously, once, once you're used to being uh, a bookie or a gambler, it's quite hard to let it go. But, you know, that's, that's my old life now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, kind of hard to be the clearer and still running the, running the fund on a day-to-day basis. <laughs> yeah, a little bit. That would be a bit of a challenge, and certainly maybe from a regulatory perspective uh, there as well. Let's look out here and see what was popping off here from a vol perspective this week. Vol, looking at 30-day realize. Again, most of this data coming from our friends over there at SKU, SK3W. Uh, they'll be on the show again pretty soon. They've had a new round of funding, so it'll be interesting to catch up with them. Check it out if you haven't used it in a while. It's some great analytics over there on their side of the space. Uh, 30-day realize pretty much unched from where it was last week. It was about a 56 last week, about a 54 this week, so not a lot going on net Week to week from a vol perspective here. Looking at the options volume as well. Also kind of a light week. You know, actually, Darshan, this might be an interesting thing you could you could shed some light on. You know, we've talked about this before. I think we actually have a listener question maybe a little bit later about a similar similar level here. But we'll, we'll just dive into it now. Uh, you know, looking at the numbers, we kind of use the barometer for Deribit. Obviously, Deribit, one of the leading platforms out there for Bitcoin options. We kind of use that barometer of around 30 million Overall value, you know, changing hands as being kind of a, an active day or not. And pretty much, despite the fact that we had a big swing out there over the past week, like I mentioned, selling all the way off, threatening that 100-day moving average, and then bouncing right back up, didn't really see a ton of paper out here this week. In fact, the only one day above that 30 million threshold, which was on the third, they did about 43 million over there on Deribit. You were obviously out there making markets on Deribit. Does that surprise you, or you think that maybe there's still a little room to grow over there? And from a Deribit options perspective, yeah, I mean, I think that market will grow over time. Um, I think people have begun using OTC space as well to have more bespoke options outside of just Deribit. So as people get more comfortable with Deribit, though, they've done a great job at. Um, uh, building that trust, and I feel like they have a really robust, uh, reliable system. But you know, the majority of institutions are still warming to the space. Are probably not actively trading it on the moves, but perhaps just if it is institutional or structured flow, perhaps they just digest what's happened and then um, start trading again once they sort of find find a level. So it's not necessarily that. People aren't responding to the volatility, but yes, in in more mature markets, I I would expect a much bigger spike in volume whenever there's such crazy activity. But I think because it's a maturing market, um, it will just happen a little bit more gradually. But I think the OTC space is getting a bit more uh, sophisticated and much more on the structured product side. But I think Deribit is building a lot of trust with those same institutional players and it will continue to grow over time. But I think for the retail guys, when it's busy, it's just easier to trade futures. The The risks are much more obvious. And so they'll probably just default to trading futures on Deribit as opposed to options and then wait till it's a bit quieter to trade options. So I think, I think it can perhaps lead to a lagged volume slightly further down, uh, maybe a few days later or a few weeks later. Interesting. I'll have you keep that options market maker hat on just for two more seconds, if you don't mind. Take the clearing hat off, put the, put the former market maker hat on back for two seconds. But give our listeners a little bit of a, of a glimpse. What was the kind of flow you used to see uh, on a regular basis over there on Derby? But what were some of the size transactions? And obviously, when we're trading you know, listed things like the SPX on the SIBO or VIX or things like that, you expect a certain degree of volume and, and types of size institutional trades. Obviously, a different game when you're making markets in the options over there on Deribit. What was your typical day like? What were some of the orders you used to engage with? What was the kind of the flow you used to see over there? Yeah, I mean, it, it was very mixed, but there were the traditional hedges, for example, that, that they were quite rare, but, you know, people just buying outright puts to cover their portfolio. But, you know, we traded a lot through a bear market, so there wasn't a ton of interest in buying puts on the lows. But um, outside of that, it was yield generation through selling calls if you were a long only fund that just wanted to generate some yield. So we do still see that. And I think that's a space that's growing massively. Um, and then outside of that, the, um, the, the leveraged plays that people want. So we saw a lot of retail players buying um, either just outright calls against some of the other hedges that they've done in the market or um, perhaps premium friendly um 
call structures. So where they do like a call spread or a ratio call one by two. Um, th- those were the kind of flows we saw, at least OTC, just to try and make things a little bit more premium friendly, take advantage of the high skew and the high vols. Um, so vols have come in a little bit over the last few weeks, but I still think there's um, the majority of the flows are in that sort of bracket that I, I keep hearing about. Let's look here and see what was lighting it up out here on Deribit this week. Like we said, a kind of a quiet week, not a lot coming across our, our screens here. Probably one of the bigger, more interesting prints, kind of reminiscent of some of the prints we break down a lot on our volatility show out there in VIX Options Land. If you listen to that show, listeners, you know that that, that one by two, that selling one, buying two on the call side is a pretty popular trade out there in VIX land. Seems like someone has a, a similar notion out here in Bitcoin options this week. Looks like the one by two went up. Uh, again, not, they're a little bit different. You don't get the mark to spread and that sort of thing. Not up at the same time, but close enough and in size enough and on the same same day and structure that we could reasonably intuit that it was probably a spread. It was the March 12,000, 16,000, one by two paper selling 250 of the 12,000 calls against 500, hence the one by two of the 16,000 calls. So that was kind of interesting. You don't see a lot of those type of ratio spreads going up for decent size. Seeing that one there. An interesting trade. We said it before. We like it a lot in, in the vol space under certain conditions. And obviously this trade, you know, breaking through 12,000 through the upside could have some problems. But as you get farther north of that, get up towards that 16,000 level. So you should look at this, listeners, as a, as a, as a trade certainly to – Pick up some upside. This thing really wants Bitcoin to pop. Could be a hedge against some extreme far upside movement as well. Either way, though, someone looking looking for a little bit of upside. It seems like this week done. All this was done, by the way, right around the uh, right around the time that Bitcoin was around eighty one thirty or so. So decent timing there from an underlying perspective as well. They caught a little bit of that upside swing with this one. So interesting stuff. We like to keep our eyes peeled for interesting trades out there, and that one certainly. Coming across our radar. Looking at the vol term structure here, pretty similar to last week. The vol up ever so slightly, up a couple of points there in the front month. But that slope a little bit steeper. But other than that, not a lot going on from a term structure perspective. Looking at a call to put out here. Calls back leading the dance. Probably some of that having to do with the recent upswing we just saw last week. It was pretty much all puts all the time. That seemed like well-timed paper in light of what we saw the sell-off, of course, the last week this week. Calls back in the driver's seat up to 57% from 47%. Last week, of course, that's still well off the peak we saw a few months back of about 84.5% to the call side. OI, a similar story, up slightly this week. Not a ton going on there. Up from $352 million up to about $371 million. Remember, that's off that, that recent max we saw back in earlier this summer of around $658 million or so. So OI still around half of that that record level we saw not too long ago. Checking in on the futures. Deshaun, we just talking about uh, the futures out here. A decent volume day, but a pretty surprisingly light volume week, especially given the fact that we've seen so much movement in the underlying out there. You think maybe the futures would do a little bit more today. Like I said, a pretty active day coming into partway through the show here. We're seeing the futures having done over 5,000 contracts in that front month there, that front OC contract, about 5,500. Another roughly 500 or so in the other months. So you're talking about 6,000. Remember, that's a 5X contract, so it's about 30,000 coins changing hands out there today. The rest of the week, uh, kind of light. The highest volume day we saw was actually back on the 30th, so on our last show. Again, this show, Moving Markets, <laughs> uh, was about 5,300 contracts back on the 30th. Pretty much every other day of the past week was at or below 2,000 contracts, which is pretty surprising, all things considered. You know, Sean, is, is this a market, you know, the, the listed futures market? It seems like it's been growing maybe this week, not so much, but this is a market you guys have your eye on over there at X Margin? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think um, the regulated... Uh, listed markets are going to be important in driving adoption and it's up to the other unregulated or perhaps not US regulated exchanges to compete with that because there's um, there's a ton of trust that these guys already have as a default and so it's about the other exchanges perhaps coming up with solutions to still entice that flow and you know at the moment they're winning in terms of liquidity and volume and um, I think that's a good thing for crypto to to have both of those two dynamics at play. Um, and I mean, I think that the 
the open interest, uh, like you said, it's it's been interesting to see how it's not massively grown um, on these big moves. But I think it's also good to see that the markets are staying liquid, they're staying relatively stable, and that should only entice more people into the market as, as we grow. Speaking of growing, let's see if the altcoin market grew as well as we dive on into the altcoin universe. It's time to move beyond Bitcoin and find out what's moving the rest of the crypto marketplace. It's time to boldly venture into the altcoin universe. All right, everybody. Welcome to the altcoin universe, the portion of the program where we break down everything outside of Bitcoin. Yes, there are other products that trade outside of Bitcoin. Let's see. Let's break down some market cap first. Remember, take these overall numbers with a bit of a grain of salt, but maybe the percentages, I think, are a little bit more reliable. Bitcoin, obviously, still at the top of the heap, right around $150 billion in terms of overall market cap. Number two, ETH, with about $19.5 billion. It puts it at about 13%. Number three, XRP, with a little bit north of $11 billion, going up about 7.6% out there. Number four, Bitcoin Cash at about four and a quarter billion. That puts it at about 2.9%, almost 3% there for overall market cap. Litecoin, number five, about 2.5% market cap. That puts it at about 3.65 billion. Let's throw in a little EOS there as well. You guys, you guys have been writing in. You like yourself some EOS. That's about a little north of 2% these days. That puts it at about three and a quarter billion. Before I dive in here, some more Darshan. Obviously, you guys are clearing. I'm, I'm assuming Bitcoin is the primary contract there. But are there any altcoin over there that are lighting up your tape these days over there at X margin? Yeah, I mean, I think we've had, uh, I mean, we're asset agnostic, so we're interested in all of them. But Ethereum is definitely one we get asked about a lot. There's people that have raised money in Ethereum and they're always looking to hedge. And, um, and yeah, it's been interesting to see uh, what all the other asset classes are doing. Some of them uh, growing a little bit, more than expected this week, I, I guess, Ripple being the one I'm talking about. And it's interesting to see how that's picking up speed again. But certainly we focus a lot a lot more on Ethereum and Bitcoin um, as that's where the user base is most demanding it and has got the most available data. Have you been getting a little bit of an uptick in interest in Ripple recently? Uh, I, I wouldn't say that, no. Um, I wish I had a bit more of an elaborate response to that. But no. <laughs> <laughs> I thought when you said that earlier, I thought maybe you were getting an influx because you know that's been one of those one of those one of those you know contracts out there that people were so excited about back in the in the hot and heavy go go days of two, 2017 when everything was racing the twenty thousand on the Bitcoin side and it seemed like all these other altcoin were getting a lot of love. I know early twenty eighteen we saw Ripple race up to around three bucks with all the rumors it was going to get spread on onto new platforms and then it hasn't really. Hasn't really retraced those levels. Getting a little bit of a lift here this week, our old friend XRP. You know, last week it seemed like it was kind of just mired back down around that 25 cent level. This week, getting a little bit of a lift up almost two cents again, up to about 27 and a half or so here this week. So getting a little bit of a lift, not quite back north of that 30 cent level where it seemed like it was living for quite some time, but off that bottom we saw last week. So maybe Ripple fans can, can take a little solace in that ETH. As you were mentioning earlier, having a decent week, kind of quiet but not bad. Up at the end, of the, at the end of the week, it's up. So that's pretty much that's pretty much a good week for the ETH fans. Up, they're up about three bucks or so, coming in right around one eighty one or so here, most of the way through the show. Litecoin also kind of a bit of a quiet week, kind of quiet pretty much across the altcoin universe. Really, Litecoin up about two dollars uh, from last week, coming at at about well, it was actually actually giving up a little bit. It was at about fifty eight thirty. Now it's at about, yeah, it's a little bit shy of 58, so give up a few cents here during the show. Not a huge move up there again. That's about two bucks from last week. Bitcoin Cash, uh, size wise, the dollar wise, the largest mover, up about eight, eight handles uh, from last week. That puts it at about 236, almost 237. Giving some of that back now throughout the show, down to about a 235 or so right now, but still one of the larger movers out here in the space. And, you know, I like to save a little bit of time for you guys. You guys have some questions on your brain. So I think without further ado, because it's kind of quiet out here in Altcoin this week, let's keep on rolling into your crypto questions. You've got questions about crypto. Who doesn't? It's time to find out the answers to your crypto questions. All right. You guys know how to get at us on this show. You can find us at Options on most of the major social media platforms. You can use the live stream. You can use... The email, questions at the options, That works or pretty much whatever platform you listen to this show on usually is a way 
to get back at us on it. Just don't don't post a question in the reviews and like iTunes or things like that. Those usually aren't as timely accessible by us. So uh, <laughs> if you have a question, hit us up in one of those more timely venues, just like our listeners did here today. Let's start off with Alliance Allianz. Let's go with Alliance. Alliance wants to know. Are the same firms making markets in regular options like Susquehanna also making the markets on Deribit and other crypto markets? Well, interesting question. Uh, you know, Darshan, this is a good thing we got you on here today because uh, this is right up your wheelhouse. Going to have you put your old hat on again, your old market maker hat on. Uh, you guys are obviously out there making markets in uh, Deribit, maybe some OTC as well. We obviously had the Akuna guys on this show for a long time. They're very active in the OTC side. So probably put some up on Deribit as well. Uh, what other firms were you engaging with out there on Deribit from a market making side there, Darshan? Yeah, I mean, um, I think there are offshoots from traditional firms that have set up just like us. And, you know, Deribit's done a great job at forming that trust of, you know, people depositing money with them and running a smooth exchange. And so, yeah, the likes of Acuna, GSR, they're all from the traditional finance world. Uh, uh, there's Altpoint or Cypher, uh, Elwood. Um, they're all active on Deribit as far as I'm aware. And um, when we were market making, there were a ton of professional traders from the traditional finance world. As far as the firms themselves go, like Sesakana, I think they are now joining the space and essentially adapting their technologies to make Deribit a bit more efficient. So I think that that will continue to that trend will continue to happen. But certainly, I, I know for a fact there are some that have entered the space. Yeah, many out there. More probably considering. Certainly, the recent upswing has uh, over the last six months or so has helped renewed interest. I've heard rumblings of some of these firms, not Susquehanna so much, but others out there that they're looking at maybe dipping their toes. And all of them have some, some traders on some desks at least paying attention to this and, and maybe gearing up behind the scenes. Uh, so I think I wouldn't be surprised if we see more firms if we continue at these levels and these volatility and movements maybe starting to dip their toes into these waters, particularly as these other elements we're talking about, the plumbing, the infrastructure, more of that in the crypto space starts to get up to speed for the type of things that they need. It's still hard to are between these different venues and hedge yourself and things like that. As that stuff gets more up to speed, then I think we'll expect to see more of these firms getting in there. Uh, Charles has a question. This kind of goes back to what we were talking about earlier, uh, Darshan. Uh, he wants to know, why do you think Bitcoin options volume remains light despite big swings in the spot? You know, Charles, we were just talking about that. We saw another big swing this week, you know, selling off seven, 800 handles and then bouncing right back. And yet the options volume, at least on Deribit, not exactly blowing the doors off. We saw that funky one by two. That was kind of interesting, but not a ton going on outside of that. Uh, it is an interesting question. I guess, Darshan, I need you to put your market maker hat on again. We touched on this earlier. You know, We kind of hinted that we think maybe there's more to come from this space. But uh, you were actually obviously out there making markets out there during these kind of swings. Why do you think we're still not seeing you know, the, the massive numbers that some might expect given these big swings we're seeing out there in the underlying Bitcoin? Yeah, I think, I think it's all down to the same sort of thing that we were discussing earlier, that perhaps the institutional players um, are either you know, waiting for the plumbing to be right uh, before they dip their toes into actually trading in options on Deribit, for example, um, or just in general, they're a bit slower to react. They're not trading actively, but waiting for things to calm down and then do a structured trade. So like the one by two or like um, other more trades that are better to execute in a quieter market. So I think that there is retail flow that is still interested in um, crypto options and there is institutional flow that is dabbling in, in crypto options. But until we have like a solid infrastructure, I think um, – it's just going to be a gradual process while um, while these exchanges attract more institutional players. But in my opinion, still that you know the retail guys are improving their familiarity with options and as a result, trading them more actively. And um, you know, but in in times of volatility, it's just human nature to perhaps go to what you know better, and perhaps that's why futures trade a little bit more actively than options in a busy time. Well, speaking of the futures, we'll wrap up with this question here from Jay, Jay Lee. Uh, you kind of you kind of touched on this earlier, at least invoking their name. They've been a big topic of conversation in the crypto space of late. Of course, I'm talking about Bact. 
uh, Jay Lee asking, can we now complain, excuse me, can we proclaim now? Can we proclaim it now? Easy for me to say here. A lot, a lot of talking here in the network today. Can we proclaim it now that backed was the nail in the crypto coffin? You know, this is an interesting story. It's been a long kind of protracted saga <laughs> with uh, the back. They, of course, announced it quite some time ago. Then there was a lot of hemming and hawing behind the scenes. Will they, will they launch? What will they launch with? They finally launched a few weeks ago with their first contracts. I believe they have a daily and a monthly future. Of course, the, the big deal in the neck of the woods is that it's a, a physically deliverable type of contract, which we've had people on the show since then, you know, obviously proclaiming their interest in that. Some people thinking that that physically deliverable contract was was holding back some of these large institutional players who want to do traditional things like covered calls or buy puts. Having something that expires into the actual <laughs> underlying is a lot easier for a lot of those types of trades. And so some people thought that that would be the inflection point. The launching of Bact would really be the moment that would bring in a lot more institutions. And so we saw a lot of people out there on a broad spectrum of venues really talking up the Bact launch as Kind of uh, maybe the moment when the worm was going to turn yet again for Bitcoin to the upside. Uh, fast forward a couple of weeks, and at least in the early going here, doesn't seem like that's the case. Of course, we talked about a sell-off or almost immediately after they launched on the show last week. And of course, yet again now, we've had another week and another pronounced downturn in Bitcoin. We ended up pretty much unched on the week, but it looked pretty dicey there for a little bit. And all this happening, of course... Post backed. Uh, maybe Darshan, we'll start with uh, what are your thoughts on this much ballyhooed launch of backed? You know, what, what are your thoughts on their physically deliverable type contract and maybe the impact for the market? And then from the question from Jay Lee here, do you think he or she is right that maybe backed is, is the nail in the coffin here? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think um, my opinion of backed is that it's. We were probably, as a market, expecting way too much uh, from what it could achieve straight away. Um, and I think the expectations were a little bit out of sync with what it was going to be great for. Um, I don't actually believe that a lot of traditional finance uh, derivatives are actually settled physically in reality. Like A lot of it is closed out way before the physical settlement. And so... I'm not sure that that was going to lead to a bunch of institutional flow, but it is helpful to have physical settlement as an option. Um, you know, as a not necessarily as a as something that's required, but it's something that can help drive institutional flow. But perhaps we were expecting a little bit too much in the market from what it could achieve in terms of institutional um, adoption. But I think what it does do, which is extremely positive, is that it. Um, it's got this backed warehouse that can become a sort of clearing mechanism for physical spot. And um, the, the backed warehouse is something that's probably slightly underplayed as part of what, what's, um, what's beneficial for the market. So um, it, I think it's great from a custody perspective that we now have this regulated um, entity that is – involved in the custody of funds for institutional players and so i think over time that part of it will be the more valuable part as opposed to um, nuances with how derivatives are settled yeah you know it was <laughs> like, like all things in the crypto market things get to get to be blown a little bit out of proportion it does seem like the early response to uh to back to, on both sides was a little histrionic you know i, I never believed that that was going to be the inflection point that the physically settled contract was going to be it. Yes, yeah, so when I saw all these very, very positive outlines and uh, write-ups that it was going to be the new moment that the worm turns, I never really understood that level of interest. But it, you're right. Having something that is large, centrally cleared over time could help bring... And just having a large, physically settled, deliverable contract with some big, recognizable players in the space and indeed beyond, Microsoft part of that as well, that could certainly help to lend more credibility to the space, which in turn could hopefully bring more institutional players uh, over time. But yeah, Jay Lee, doesn't sound like either of us were ever really on the train <laughs> that uh, back was either the beginning of the upswing or maybe as you view it, the nail in the crypto coffin. I don't really see it. As either, then it's only been a couple of weeks. Give them some time to really let it play out before we pronounce them as the savior of the space or indeed the death knell of it. Unfortunately, listeners, that music means we've come to the end of another epic journey 
through the world of crypto, talked a lot of fun things on the world of margin, central clearing, got into some of the action, the volatility, the skew, all that good stuff, wrapped up with some altcoin and indeed your questions. Darshan, glad to have you on the program here this week. If our listeners are intrigued by what you're talking about over there at X Margin, maybe they want to learn more, where should they go? What should they do? Sure. I mean, you can look us up on Twitter. We're on X, at X Margin Clearing, and we're on uh, xmargin.io. Um, happy to have a conversation. And yeah, it was really nice talking to you as well. And uh, thanks so much for having me on. There you go. Check them out for yourselves. X Margin. Just the letter X and then Margin. Dot io is the place to go to learn more. And on behalf of Darshan and indeed myself, I want to thank all of you out there for downloading, streaming, subscribing, for listening live, for sending in those questions. Keep them coming. We love hearing from you guys. And we'll see you back here next week for more of the Crypto Rundown. You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available on the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com.